All right, let's let's jump right in then. Um, quick recap. So we basically just reviewed prerequisites for the course. Um, the hope is um, ev all of you are now more or less on the same page in terms of uh, prerequisites. Um, also, the, 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 the kind of material that we covered in the prerequisites give you a flavor of you know, the kind of uh, mathematical background you're expected to have and the kind of you know, problems that you'll be solving in the homework. So hopefully that's, that's informative for you in terms of um, um, expecting what, to come, uh, what comes in the rest of the course. So we covered linear algebra uh, and we, we went over some matrix calculus. Uh, matrix calculus uh, mostly we are, we are interested in, in you know, for example, uh, taking derivatives of a scalar valued function with respect to a vector valued input. You know, that's the most common thing we'll be doing um, uh, in this course, uh, either vector valued input or matrix valued input, but more, most of the times it's a scalar valued output, which is gonna be like your loss function. Uh, we're gonna cover that today. Uh, we also covered uh, probability theory, some, some uh, parts of probability theory. Um, and then um, on Friday, we, we touched upon maximum likelihood expectation. That's you know, uh, just, just uh, a small part of mathematical statistics that's kind of uh, relevant to, uh, or, or that part that's most relevant to this course. And um, we, we saw the example of how you, can, how you can use maximum likelihood estimation to estimate the parameters of a, a Gaussian, uh, a multivariate Gaussian. And we saw that, um, what, what um, the estimators that we obtained for the mean and covariance happen to be very intuitive ones, right? For example, the mean, the, the mean estimator turned out to be just the average of the given, you know, uh, x's and the covariance happens to be the sample covariance of, of the um, given inputs. So um, it's, it's nice to see that, um, you know, the intuitive definitions happen to, you know, be well grounded in some solid theory. So today we're gonna to switch gears and start supervised learning. Supervised learning is basically um, deals with problems where we are trying to learn a mapping from some input X to some output Y, right? And the input X and Y are, could be anything. Um, most of the times um, the in, um, we're gonna be dealing with problems that are either regression problems or classification problems. Those are like the most common kind of uh, machine learning uh, problems. And depending on the problem, for example, if it is regression, right? And let's say we are trying to predict uh, the price of say uh, houses. And you're given the uh, living area and this is the price, right? So you may have, right, let's call this in, in, in square feet. So let's say uh, you're given a data set that has mappings X and Y or pairs of X and Y where X is, um, where each example denotes uh, one, one house and the X of that row is the, is the um, living area in, in some unit and the Y of that row is the price in some unit. Right? And given this data set, um, we could for example plot it like this. So the unit here is square feet and the unit here is $1,000 and you may get, right? So um, what do we have here? So here uh, we have a plot where each dot represents one row, right? And the X coordinate of the dot is the X value and the Y coordinate of the dot is the corresponding Y value. And this, this is just a scatter plot of the uh, housing prices data set. And the goal here is to learn some function, 
let us call it um, a hypothesis. The reason it is called hypothesis is, is not very crucial. So, we want to learn a hypothesis, we will call it h of x, which is some function of x that is similar to or, or um, that's a, that, that gives you an output that is as close as possible to y. That is the, um, um, that is the goal of a regression problem, right. And in there are some other cases where what you are trying to learn is um, a classification problem where And here x1 and x2. So, here this was x and this was y, x was scalar value. But imagine a different problem where your x's have two have, have two attributes instead of just one attribute. Let us say there was um, a second attribute, uh, you could call it you could call it um, um, for example, number of bedrooms, right? And in, in and there's going to be a corresponding. Um, maybe let me just um, write this differently. Let's say you have a different data set where you have x1, x2, and y, and each example again is one row, and your y's are zeros and ones and your x would be some values, where the 0 and 1 tell you what class the example belongs to. And our goal is to learn some kind of a classifier, which is, you know, some hyperplane that divides your x's into two parts. And the, the, uh, the goal is to learn a suitable hyperplane such that most of the positive examples are on one side and most of the negative examples are on the other side. And these are two different kinds of supervised learning problems um, and we call it supervised because with each example there is a corresponding y that is given to us which is like uh, that is the supervision signal where it tells you what the right answer is for each given example. Right? And for the probably the first third or first half of the course we are going to be focusing on supervised learning problems and the two most common problems we are going to be looking at are regression and classification. And to set up the basic terminology, we are going to stick with this terminology, in fact throughout the course. Um, in supervised settings, we are going to call the inputs as x and the outputs as y. n is going to be the number of examples in our training set. Right? You are given a training set from which we want to learn some uh, a hypothesis and the number of examples um, in the training set is, is going to be n in all your homeworks and, and you know, uh, through the rest of the course. And we are going to call the, a given pair x, y as an example in a supervised learning training set. Now, d is going to be the number of dimensions of our input. In this case, d was 1. In this case, d is 2, right? But d could be, you know, an arbitrarily large number um, of, of uh, dimensions of the input. And we are going to use superscript i with a parenthesis to indicate that it is the ith example. So, x i would be the x 1 you know uh, uh, um, x 1 x 2 of the ith example and y i will be the corresponding uh, 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 y i will be the corresponding label. So, we, we, we generally call the y's as labels or ground truth and x will be called uh, your input. So, y is the example output or you can call it label or ground truth, right. And uh, when given a pair x i y i together they form the ith example, ith super, uh, supervised uh, learning example. Any questions about this terminology? So, you're not to confuse whenever there is a parenthesis, you know, it means we are not taking the ith power of x or the ith power of y. It means, you know, it's just the ith example, right? 
and in the case of uh, regression problem y i will be a real valued number right and in case of classification y i will be y i will be in 0 or 1 if it is binary classification if it is a multi class classification then y i will be you know uh, it can take more number of discrete values. Right. So, this, this is you know uh, to set up the uh, terminology uh, any, any questions about the terminology? If not let us let us um, let us jump into supervised learning. Right. So, the big picture of supervised learning we saw this picture uh, is you are given a training set, training set is the set of x i y i pairs where i is from 1 to n right. This means uh, 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 a set of x i y i pairs n, n, n of them and using this training set we want to run it through some learning algorithm now the the specific algorithm that we choose will depend on what y i is for example if it's real valued then it has to be a regression learning algorithm if it's discrete valued then it has to be a a, a classification algorithm and the output of the learning algorithm is our hypothesis or the learned hypothesis So, the, this, this uh, h, uh, h of x is going to be the output of the learning algorithm and this, this output or this model that we call or the learnt model, let us call this the learnt model, can now take a new x's, let us call this uh, x test right and output the corresponding y hat. So, um, this is the, the, uh, the big picture of supervised learning and all the algorithms that we are going to study are going to follow this pattern, right. So, we start with the training set, we will run it through the learning algorithm, we obtain a model and the model can now take examples from what we call as the test set or you know uh, these could be examples that, that are fed into the model when you actually deploy the model in production. And the, the, the goal here is that even though we are learning from a fixed set of examples, we hope to generalize well to examples that we have not seen before. So, x test in general will be an example that your model has never seen before and we hope to, um, we hope that the algorithm that we have learned or the model that we have learned will output y's that are you know kind of correct in some way. So, with that uh, let us start with our very first learning algorithm linear regression. So, in linear regression x is an R d and y is an R right and that is the training set that we are given n, n such things, um, n such examples okay. and now we want to learn uh, a, a hypothesis which belongs to a family. What do we mean by that? So, in this, in this setting we did not we did not impose any kind of restriction on what h can be. It could be any function whatsoever that takes x as an input and produces some real some some uh, some y. However, that is a very broad class of algorithms, a very broad broad class of uh, hypotheses, and we want to limit the the family of hypotheses over which we are going to learn in some way. Right? And the most simplest form of uh, such a hypothesis is called a linear hypothesis and we are going to write it in this way h theta of x 
is equal to x naught plus theta 1 x 1 plus theta 2 x 2 plus theta d x d right. Um, what is happening here? So, the hypothesis that we want to learn has some parameter theta and theta is in this case, well before I, I tell what um, uh, theta is, um, this should be theta naught. naught. So, um, the hypothesis that we learn comes with a, a theta vector that has d plus 1 components right 1 through d corresponding to the x's and and uh, uh, another theta naught so theta naught or theta is in r d plus 1 this is the extra uh, plus 1 that we get and the goal of linear regression is to learn a suitable set of parameters theta that that make uh, y value as close as possible to h theta of x right that is the that is the uh, that is the goal of, of uh, learning algorithm and this we can also write h theta of x is equal to summation of i equals 1 to d theta i x i plus theta naught right and we will adopt the convention that we will add a new column to our x's let us call it x naught and that will be equal to 1 for all the examples right and which means I can we can now write h theta of x to be theta naught x naught plus theta 1 x 1 plus theta d x d right and this is also easier to i equals this time from 0 to d theta i x i right and this can also be written as theta transpose x right. This this additional term that we include in all our examples where we just set it to 1 is also called the intercept term and this is mostly just for notational convenience right uh, there is there is you know there is absolutely no difference between this version and this version uh, except for notation here we have an annoying extra additive term here there is no annoying extra additive term that is about you know it is just notational difference. Right? Now, given this, this, this family of hypotheses that we want to limit ourselves to where the specific member of the family is decided by the specific theta vector that is, that is used we are going to define something called as a cost function. Or it is also sometimes called the loss function. Right? And in this cost function or loss function, we want to capture the amount of displeasure a specific hypothesis causes to us in some way. Right? And a common, uh, a very commonly used cost function for uh, regression problems is called the uh, uh, squared error and we are going to define it like this. So, all the cost functions or loss functions uh, in this course will be called j right and we call it a cost function when we want it to be small. We de the, the desired output for a cost function should be you know small. 
and this is going to be defined as half of i equals 1 to So what's happening here? We have n training examples i from 1 to n and for each example we take the hypothesis that, that we obtain by some given theta that is an input to the cost function, calculate what that hypothesis will, uh, what output that hypothesis uh, will output and calculate the squared error between the correct answer and the output of that hypothesis and square it, right. This is also called the squared error um, and this is a very commonly used uh, loss function, right. And for different values of theta, the cost function will evaluate to different, different values for the given uh, training set. Yes, question? Why do we have a half here? Uh, good question. I'll, I'll come to that shortly. Um, the 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 thing to uh, uh, observe here is that for the from the cost functions point of view, theta is the only variable. Right? The training set that we have given is is kind of embedded in this function. It's fixed. Right? And if you if we obtain a different set of training uh, a different training set of of having um, uh, different uh, features and, and, and labels, the cost function is going to be different. So the thing that makes one cost function different from another is one of course the functional form and also the training set is itself. So the training set, the training data that we have is kind of embedded into the cost function, right? That's, that's, uh, that's something you want to uh, keep in mind, right? And now the goal is to find theta hat which is, which somehow minimizes the cost function, right? And theta, and you know this is theta of i equals one to n h theta of x i. I I square, right? So we want to find that theta that minimizes the cost function to the smallest value possible, right? Any 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 questions so far? Yes. Sure. So the question is: Should we be dividing it by the number of examples to um, um, to normalize this? So if our goal is to find uh, the lowest possible cost itself or the loss value itself, then yes, um, it, it matters a lot whether we normalize this by n or not. But the goal here is to find the argument, which is, you know, um, what is the value of theta that minimizes this the most, right? And the value that minimizes, the value of theta that minimizes the cost the most is the same whether, you know, the cost is this value or the cost is this times 1 over n, right? It, it, you can take one over n, you know, outside, and the value that theta evaluates to will always be the same. So, in terms of, um, if the interest is in finding the small theta, then it it doesn't matter whether you normalize it by n or not. Good question. Right. Now, the question is now: How are we going to perform this minimization? Right. What's what's what? Uh, what do we do to actually perform this minimization? Because this is just a mathematical expression. This is not an algorithm. Right? The algorithm will tell us how we are going to perform this minimization process. Right? And this brings us to our first algorithm, what we call as gradient descent. Right? So, to perform gradient descent, uh, let me let me start with some pictures to um,
Okay. What I have drawn here are so the two axes are x1 through let's call this xd. Imagine there are you know this is in a in a, in a d-dimensional space. Uh, it's easy to visualize it in a two-dimensional space, but you know uh, it's 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 representing a d-dimensional space. And what I have drawn here is the contour plot of the cost function. Now, um, this plot is fundamentally different from the two plots we saw over there. Over there, the axes were data, and here the axes is the parameters, right? A very different plot, right? We have the the uh, the axes uh, to be the parameters, and this is the contour plot of uh, of the cost function. What's the contour plot? Yes. Yeah, so good question. Good question. So uh, the question is, shouldn't the uh, y-axis be j of theta and uh, the theta one and and through theta db be, be kind of uh, uh, on the x-axis? Um, that so um, the answer is this is a contour plot, right? In a contour plot, what we what we do is we trace out the set of all the set of all uh, uh, points in, in theta which output a specific value of j theta. So this corresponds to j of theta equals 1 and this corresponds to j of theta equals 2 and this corresponds to j of theta equals 3, right? It's, it's a very different way of, of, of looking at, at uh, of, of, of plotting things, right? The the value of j theta is not visible here, and it is it's kind of implicit in the shape of the contours that we draw, right? Now uh, a few things that you can observe is that uh, what can we say about the shape of j theta here? Right? Yeah, it's like a bowl shape where it is minimized at this value. And as you as you kind of move farther away in the parameter space from this value, your the cost function evaluates to larger values. Right? Is is, the, is this clear? Yes. Question. So, so the question is, can we also not think of this as a, a dome shape? Right? Uh, you this this would also be the contour plot of a, of a dome shaped. Uh, function, if the values w were in the other way, this is three, this is two, this is one. Then, uh, for for these values of of j theta, then this would be a dome shape, right? Now, as we get closer to the center, the value j theta evaluates to become smaller and smaller, so it kind of you know comes down to uh, as as we move to the center. Good question. Now the the cost function that we described over here, where theta is in some um, d plus one dimension because of the extra intercept term, right? So perhaps this is theta d plus one, right? Now the goal is to find the theta that minimizes this cost function. So assume this cost function takes the shape; it could be you know uh, um, you know some shape, um, and now we want to find a theta that minimizes this cost function um, to the smallest possible value. Yes, question. Very good question. So how do we know that um, 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 there is only one value of theta that minimizes uh, the cost function? Uh, in general, it need not. Uh, if you, uh, the correct way to actually write this is, you know, theta belongs to argument where argument gives you a set of minimizers. Right? There could be multiple values of theta that minimize your uh, minimize your function. For example, um, imagine this to be the cost function, and your cost function has this shape. So any theta along this line is a minimizer. It's not a bowl shape. It's just you know um, um, that it's just that the minimum value can be attained by multiple values of theta along the line. In 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 such cases, uh, argmin is actually a set of theta values. But for for the most part, we'll be assuming that there is one unique. Uh, minimizer. Good question. So, um, 
So our our um, our goal is to find the value of, of of theta, where j theta is the smallest, and for this we're going to use an algorithm called gradient descent. Now, how does gradient descent work? So gradient descent, we start with a random initial value of theta. So we set theta, let's call it theta naught equal to you know some initialization. A common initialization is to just start with theta naught equal to 0 at the origin, right? Theta naught. Now it is uh, again important not to confuse with the superscript I am using here. If it is data, then the superscript means the ith example, right? Now if you are running gradient descent, uh, the superscript over here indicates the time step, you know, after what iteration we are, uh, uh, you know, the, the value of theta that we get at uh, a particular iteration, right? So uh, set theta naught, uh, you know, initialize it to some value, it could be the origin. And then um, So first, I'm going to write it um, in in the in the partial uh, partial derivative notation, and then uh, in a gradient form. So theta j of one will be equal to theta j of zero minus alpha times j. What does that mean? So we are at theta naught uh, equal to zero, or, or yeah, at, at theta naught. So first, what we do is we find the partial derivative of the function j with respect to some coordinate j. Right? J can take a value between one to d plus one, right? And we calculate the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to j. And maybe I'll use a different color over here. We have multiplied by some constant alpha, right? Where alpha is what we call as a learning rate. Right? And we repeat this for all j's, for all j in 1 to d plus 1, right? And this is, um, with this rule, we calculate, we, we calculate uh, theta j for, uh, uh, for the next iteration, right? And that's going to give us, for example, a theta 1. Now what's happening here? The an easy way to understand this is to look at this with uh, with the vector notation. So in the vector notation, this will look like theta 1 is equal to theta naught minus alpha times the gradient with respect to theta of right. In this notation, which is the same as this So we have the loss function j over here and the gradient of a scalar valued function with respect to theta will give you the direction of steepest ascent, right? So if we are at this value, the gradient of j of theta with respect to theta will tell us that you need to move in this direction to improve theta, the, to, to, to increase the value of j theta, right? Instead what we do is we flip the sign, make it a negative, which means now we are looking at this direction and update theta by moving it 
by a small amount in the direction of steepest descent right so the step size that we move right this difference is alpha times negative gradient right we started uh, a theta naught calculate the direction in which j theta increases the most flip the sign and take a small step in that direction where the step size is decided by alpha any questions here yes question so theta 0 can it be random theta 0 is some kind of an initialization and um, a common initialization is to start at 0 you can actually initialize it to uh, any any value and a topic that is a slightly more advanced is that if your cost function is convex which is it is like a, a, a bowl shaped function then the value that you initialize it to does not matter you always can you know end up the uh, when this algorithm ends you always reach the same value yes question good question how do we know we are not trapped in a local minimum i'm going to postpone that question for now and assume you know we don't have local minimums uh, we, we we'll deal with local minimums uh, later yes question yes in practice what value of alpha should we take great question and there is no um, uh, it, it, it so happens that well-defined cost functions like you know uh, gradient descent on say the linear regression are tolerant to a whole range of alphas and uh, you know um, but in practice you actually experiment with a few different values of alphas and and figure out which one works best for you <coughs> right so this is one step you know uh, this is uh, uh, one step in partial derivative notation this is one step in vector notation right and I personally feel the vector notation is easier to kind of understand this looks a little cryptic whereas over here there's a, a, a very clear geometric meaning where you are at one particular value you know in this in this uh, parameter space you you calculate the gradient of the cost function with respect to you know the current position um, and that gives you the direction of ascent you flip the sign take a small step in that direction and you you reach a new theta theta 1 such that j of theta 1 is hopefully less than j of theta naught why do I write hopefully here because if you take too large a step you can overshoot and reach you know, reach a point that is actually at, at a higher cost so uh, tuning the learning rate is important because you don't want to overstep right and as long as your learning rate is is well tuned for your cost function then this hopefully will be true most of the time And what we do, we iterate this. So repeat till convergence. Now we say repeat till convergence. What does that mean? What we mean is, um, if 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 we if I write this as theta of t plus one equals theta of t minus Alpha theta t. If we repeat this process, we will get a series of parameters right? theta zero, theta one, theta two, theta t t plus 1 right we get a series of values now for those of you who are who have a more advanced math background and know what convergence means then we are talking about the convergence of this series right when the series converges you can stop um, um, iterating now however in practice defining the convergence has a more practical definition so there are many ways to check for convergence 
one way to check for convergence is to look at the norm of theta t minus theta t minus 1. Right? Has, has, have you stopped uh, after taking a step? Um, have you reached a stage where theta t to uh, theta t minus 1 was, you know, was, was, was too small or ignorably small? That is one way to check for convergence. Another way to check for convergence is has your loss stopped going down? So j of theta of t minus j of theta of t minus 1. I am putting it as a norm, but this is just a scalar. Right? That is another way to check for convergence. Yet another way to check for convergence is was the norm of your gradient too small? So, you can look for the norm of the gradient and, and, and check if the norm of the gradient became too small or you can, you can, you can look at the difference between the two, you know, the, the previous uh, uh, parameter and the current parameter and check if, you know, that, that difference uh, got smaller than some epsilon or if, you know, your, the, the cost value itself, if it stopped, um, stopped reducing, right. There, there, there are, there's no right answer for how you want to check for convergence in practice. These are just you know, a few few thoughts on how you can uh, implement. So, in your in your code, there would be some kind of an epsilon that you define, which is you know maybe ten to the minus five or you know some some, some such small number, and you keep iterating this in a loop by you know where where you know think of t as your iteration number, and you keep iterating until one of these values becomes smaller than epsilon. So that would be like your breaking condition for the loop. Yes, question. Oh no, this just notation. So you know, think of it as the absolute value. Okay. So if if, if uh, it stops with this, yes. So the question, if I understood right, is can we not have um, 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 a way to intelligently set alpha for each iteration to get, get closer? You can you can do a whole lot of you know such variants, and there are a lot of variants of this algorithms that exist in practice. Um, but for the most part, um, we kind of exploit the fact that as you get closer to to uh, the minimum, the gradient also keeps becoming smaller. Right, so as as you get closer, the, the the overall update, even for a constant alpha, the overall update also keeps becoming smaller because your gradient also becomes uh, smaller and smaller. I mean, the the uh, intuition there is that once you reach the absolute minimum, right? So supposing this is j of theta. Right, once you reach the absolute minimum, the gradient is zero. Right. So and the gradient keeps getting smaller and smaller as you you know approach approach the minimum. Right. So uh, most of the times, some kind of a, a, a well-tuned value for alpha, constant value, is 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 you know works works well enough. Good question. Any other question? Right. So what's what's happening now? Um, we we saw this this algorithm called gradient descent, where we are given some kind of a cost function which we visualize uh, with contour plots that is defined over the parameter space, right? And the shape of the cost function has the data set kind of embedded in it, right? If you chose a different training set, then maybe your cost function is tilted differently or has a minimum at a, at a, at a different location. But the training set is kind of embedded inside this cost function itself. And now we start with a random initialization of, the, of theta. And we keep um, taking small steps in the direction of the negative gradient. And we keep taking steps until we hit some kind of a convergence, uh, a convergence condition. And there are many choices for defining what the convergence condition is. And we take this algorithm, uh, which we call as gradient descent, and apply it to the linear regression cost function. Right? We take this algorithm and we apply it to the linear regression cost function. What does that mean? It means 
the update rule that we have the update rule that we have over here will take a specific form so the methodology that we are following here is is common for pretty much all the algorithms that we're going to be that we're going to be uh, uh, studying where we define given the training set we define some kind of a cost function defined over a parameter space and use gradient descent to find a parameter that minimizes that cost function right this this is a, a common template that we repeat over and over for different algorithms the algorithm uh, for for our different models the model will give us different cost functions right and the corresponding cost function will be plugged into this algorithm until we minimize it right that's going to be a repeating pattern throughout this class so in case of you know gradient descent on linear regression right. so gradient descent on linear regression will look like this repeat un until convergence so first let's set theta not equal to some initialization right repeat until convergence theta t plus 1 equals theta t minus alpha that's the step size or the learning rate times the gradient of respect to jeta Now this is um, the standard gradient descent, and we, when we apply it to linear regression, we replace the cost function with the cost function of linear regression. So this is theta of t minus half with respect to theta. And what's the cost function? Half equals one to n. H theta of x i minus y i square. Let's simplify this further. Theta of t minus alpha times gradient half of into n. H theta of x is theta transpose x theta transpose xi <coughs> minus yi square right so just to make it clear uh, the thing that we are minimizing with respect to is with respect to theta and this is the only place where theta appears right the x's and y's are all given they are just constants uh, for the purposes of optimizing this cost function which is why we 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 think of the the training set kind of being embedded in in your cost function right they are just different constants as far as uh, the cost function is concerned right and let's let's um, expand this further using our matrix calculus tricks this is theta t minus alpha of one to n is the square um, this will give us two times I'm sorry okay so it's two times theta transpose x i minus y i times Xi. Right? And now <coughs> the two and the half cancel. So somebody asked why do we have have a half in the in the in the cost function? The reason is only to just make the gradient update rule look simple. 
just 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 the way multiplying it by one over n did not matter. In fact, the the you know half also does not matter except to make our gradient expression look look simple. And this is transpose t minus alpha times sum over i equals one to n of theta transpose x minus i x y i times x i right notice here that theta transpose x i is a scalar y i is a scalar so the theta transpose x i minus y i is also a scalar so it is a scalar times a vector and the dimension of this is d right so it is you are summing over a d dimensional vector scaled by some scalar and n such terms. So, this whole expression is d dimensional vector right and theta t was also a d dimensional vector. So, we the, the next theta t plus 1 is a d dimensional vector minus some scalar times a d dimensional vector. So, this is also a d dimensional vector right. So, when you when you when you when you uh, write out matrix calculus it is always always a good good idea to make sure that the dimensions match up. Okay. Any questions about any questions about this? So, this is the gradient update uh, algorithm where you repeat this over and over until one of the convergence conditions hit um, with, uh, with, with your training set embedded here and once you once you um, once this algorithm converges you would have solved linear regression. Yes, there was a question. Yes, so the question is what is the what what's, what's the, what are we talking about uh, theta over here? Theta is uh, the, the set of all, uh, all, all parameters which is vector valued and the superscript over here is basically saying you know which iteration in gradient descent are we at. So, this is a d dimensional vector, x is a d dimensional vector or maybe d plus 1 to account for the uh, uh, intercept. So, this is also d plus 1 dimensional and um, h theta of x is scalar, y is scalar you know, and so on. Any questions? Yes. If you take the log of the sum of the square errors, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the question. What's what's? Um, not really. So uh, taking a log wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, um, so the reason the the one half exists here is only to make this update rule look simple. There's there's no other. Uh, no other reason because you know whatever constant you have uh, you know half or, or, or any other constant you can always kind of counter it by choosing a different alpha right. So, there is um, um, no purpose for that all right. So, that is gradient descent however um, in practice what we use is a variant of um, so for, for a lot of convex functions like this for for example, for linear regression. Uh, the algorithm that you know uh, gradient descent works perfectly fine. However, there is a variant of gradient descent called stochastic gradient descent. It's called SGD. So the way SGD uh, works is it is. So, what, what, let, let, let's look at this gradient uh, descent um, algorithm on linear regression here. So, this is the update rule uh, what, what we have over here and we repeat this over and over for each each um, for each update. So, in order to make so much of progress, so the goal is we start from here and we want to reach here 
and these are small steps of progress that you are making each step that we are you know of, of gradient descent is like a small amount of progress that we are making so in order to make so much of progress one step worth of progress we need to compute this step right and for those of you who are who are probably kind of algorithmically minded you might be wondering for each small step of progress that we want to make we need to iterate over our entire training set right and the number of examples in your training set could be a million it could be a billion right in order to to make a small uh, in order to make a small step of progress we need to scan through our entire training set with this algorithm right and that can be extremely expensive if your if your um, um, training set is too big or if your uh, if if your model is also too big to compute gradients on on so many examples right and this motivates the the sgd or the stochastic gradient descent algorithm which is a variant of gradient descent where what we do is we say theta of t plus 1 is equal to theta of t plus or rather minus alpha times i am going to call this j tilde of theta where j tilde of theta is in case of linear regression it's going to be half of So what do we do? Instead of calculating the gradient of the loss function on the full training set, we instead sample just one example uniformly at random, right? And pretend that is our entire training set. Pretend that our training set has only one example. Calculate the gradient of that cost function which has only one random example. Right, and take a step in the direction according to that cost function. Right? And we take one step and repeat this process by sampling a new training example to construct this temporary or proxy loss function specific to that example. There is no summation here. We use some example k, and that k is sampled uniformly at random from your training set. And for each iteration, we sample a different example. Right. This might look, this might look, uh, it might be surprising. You might wonder, would this even work? Right. The the intuition over here is that you know um, this is our um, j theta theta one two theta d and we start at some random position right in case of gradient descent in case of gradient descent the the trajectory followed by this sequence of thetas would look something like this right you that we we are making making um, we are making progress in the direction of the final minima and taking smaller and smaller steps as we go closer and closer right this would this is a trajectory that gradient descent would have taken whereas with stochastic gradient descent the 
the updates might look like this. We start with theta naught, right? Instead of calculating the gradient with respect to the true cost function, we are calculating the gradient with respect to this proxy cost function, which has only one random example in it, right? And we're going to make a step in the negative gradient of that, you know, um, um, proxy cost function, and that's going to be our theta one. And theta two will be with respect to the next random um, example. And what we notice is that, in the, while in the case of gradient descent, the direction was consistent and always headed toward the local minima. In stochastic gradient descent, the directions are a little uh, crooked, so to speak. Right? And you might even encounter cases where you are kind of actually going in the opposite direction of you know where you actually want to go eventually. Right? But it so happens that by following this algorithm, eventually you will reach a region around the true minima, right? And all further updates of of uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent is going to keep you confined to a small ball around the true global minima, and the radius of that ball is going to be a function of the step size alpha. Right? There's a lot of theory that that um, that kind of precisely characterizes this. Uh, so, for example, if you, you know, if you're interested to go deeper into this theory, you can um, um, you can you can study stochastic approximation. That give you that 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 formally. Um, that precisely formulates the, con the the behavior of SGD. But for from this course point of view, all we need to um, know is that SGD works. Okay. So um, SGD is it makes very noisy updates because we are not taking the full set of training, uh, the full training set at every step. It's going to make noisy steps, but on average, you're going to reach the global minimum, or you're going to reach a region that is you know, sufficiently close to the global minimum, and that region is characterized by the um, by the step size alpha that you choose. Yes, question. So, is is there? Uh, can you take a running sample of uh, uh, a running sum of of the previous gradients and and do some kind of an averaging of them? Um, um, to, to kind of have less noisy updates. Yeah, there are lots of variants of, uh, of, uh, of, of gradient descent and the, um, the technique that you described is also commonly called as momentum. So when you, when you, uh, when you, lo uh, when you look up uh, all the different uh, optimization algorithms that exist for machine learning, you know, some of them are going to have this parameter called momentum, and that does uh, something exactly what you described, where it keeps like a running average of previous descents to kind of um, make the updates less noisy. So, uh, for true SGD, um, each time you pick an example, you randomly pick it. The next time you may pick the same example, but you don't care. You know, just just pick it randomly, right? Uh, but in a lot of uh, actual applications, uh, and also in the notes, what we see is you kind of scan your training set from top to bottom. Preferably, you want to shuffle your training set once, and and just loop over your training set from you know one through n, by doing a scan, by using a different example each time, and then you can just repeat again, or you know at the end of one sweep. You know, shuffle it, reshuffle it, and, and you know, um, repeat again. No, there is there is no restriction on the minimum size of uh, training um, uh, training set. The algorithm works for any training set, uh, but um, if your training set is not too large, then you know this regular gradient descent might work well for you. Um, 
Also, another uh, thing to note is that with stochastic gradient descent, you may need a lot more number of steps to converge as compared to gradient descent, but the cost of taking each step or the computational cost of each step is so small that it is well worth, well worth it to have more number of steps, uh, but they are you know, so much more inexpensive compared to a full gradient descent. Yes, question. So the question is, uh, can can we can we do something in between gradient descent and um, uh, stochastic gradient descent, where instead of one example, we we take a small batch of examples, uh, and the J tilde theta is then defined over, as a summation over that batch of examples? Yes, you can absolutely do that, and that's uh, that's called mini batch gradient descent. And in fact, most of uh, uh, you know deep learning and neural networks do exactly that, where you take a, a, a batch of examples. Uh, where the batch size is, is uh, some small number like 64 or something, yeah. Is it more advantageous to use that thing? It could be more advantageous. Um, for, for um, it so happens that the, the situations where we try, where we need to use um, um, uh, SGD or mini batch SGD happen to be with deep learning or neural networks where the cost function is not convex, right? And once you have a, a non-convex cost function, it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to analyze and make precise statements of what helps and what doesn't help. And so in, in, in those situations, it, the answer is almost always try and see if it works better. Right, right so that's SGD and gradient descent. Any, any questions before we move on? Okay. So, now that we've seen SGD and gradient descent, two different iterative algorithms, they're also called numerical algorithms because um, in order to compute the values, you actually need a computer where you, where you code this algorithm and run it and get a solution. You don't have like a, a mathematical expression for what the final answer is, right? You just describe this algorithm, implement it as code, execute it on a computer, and it's going to return some numerical values for your theta, right? And this is, this is going to be the case for most of our algorithms where we don't have a precise mathematical expression for the final answer. You're going to define a numerical solution, an iterative solution, and you then need to code it up and find a numerical answer for that particular problem. Yes, question. Yes, that's what we're coming to now. Right? So uh, the only exception, or one of the few exceptions, is linear regression, where there is a closed form a closed form solution for, for uh, uh, minimizing the cost function over here. Now, the reason why we first uh, started with gradient descent for linear regression is because taking gradients is very easy and it's easy to kind of show you how gradient descent works, right? But in practice, as an exception, you know, for linear regression, there's actually uh, a closed form solution which you can use and that's something we will see now. So first, let's redefine j theta. So first, we saw j theta to be, uh, we define it as half i equals 1 to n. Right? This was our cost function. Now, let us first rewrite this as in, in, in a vectorized notation. Let us define the, um, what you call as the design matrix. 
x which is an n by d vector and each each row in this matrix is one input input x vector right and we also define y y1 through yn right and now theta to be a vector theta1 through theta d or d plus 1 so the row of each uh, 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 the row of each design matrix is d plus 1 dimensional uh, if you include the intercept term and um, the vector theta is is uh, a d plus 1 um, dimensional vector and y is n dimensional one for each um, one for each example right now the expression x theta minus y will be the matrix x multiplied by the vector theta minus the vector y right so x is in r n by d theta is in r oh, n d plus 1 theta is in r d plus 1 and y is in r n right so uh, multiplying uh, uh, a matrix of n by d plus 1 times a vector of d plus 1 will give us a vector in r n minus r n right and this will be just in r n right so what does this look like um, x theta is equal to x1 transpose theta, xi transpose theta, xn transpose theta, right? Minus y, so we can include y right here. Minus y1 minus yi minus yn. And this is x theta minus y is this term. Is this clear? Any questions on this? And we define the j of theta to be half x theta minus y transpose x theta minus Why is this? So this is x theta minus y. We transpose it, and you know take the dot product of this with this. So it's it's basically you're squaring each term and summing them up. Right? Does that make sense? You're squaring each term and summing it up, and you're dividing it by a half, which makes this actually exactly equal to half i equals one to n theta transpose x i minus y i square right so this is the same as the original cost function that we had right? any questions here They're exactly the same here we are using vector notation here we were just you know um, um, iterating and having a loop over every example this is just a vector notation right and now um, let's try to solve for theta from the expression equal to 0 right we want to we want to set the gradient of this with respect to theta to be equal to 0 and solve for theta from this from this expression right
so half x theta minus y transpose x theta minus x theta minus y. Now the reason why there is no transpose between these two is because this is not one example, it is the full matrix, the design matrix, right. And in the matrix, every example is already in the form of a row vector, right. So um, every ex example is already in the form of a row vector, it is kind of pre-transposed for you. So this is, um, this is a vector of n dimension, of scalars of n dimension, and um, this is equal to just the cost function. And now let's let's um, just chuck through this. This is gradient of theta of half. I'm just going to uh, expand this. So x theta transpose x theta minus x theta transpose y minus y transpose x theta plus y transpose y, right. This is vector theta half of theta transpose x transpose x theta minus theta transpose x transpose y and these two are scalars and these two evaluate to the same thing and so I'm just going to make it 2 plus y transpose y, right. Any questions on how we went from here to here? There was a question on PRs of how of, of a similar, similar uh, uh, step we did for the Gaussian uh, uh, MLE of the mean of the Gaussian. Um, this is a scalar. The x is a x is a, a, a matrix. Theta is a vector. X theta is a vector. Vector uh, dot vector is a scalar. This is a scalar. So, um, and if you have scalars, the transpose of the scalar is the same thing. So, if you transpose this, you get two times um, uh, uh, the first expression. So, um, this is just two times um, two times that. And, and now um, let's observe a few things. So this is a vector and this is some scalar, uh, this is some vector and vector uh, transpose another vector is a scalar. This is the, by, uh, the uh, um, quadratic form that we've seen in the past, right? And when we take the, uh, uh, when we take the gradients, uh, we get half of two, x transpose x theta minus 2 x transpose y and this is just 0, so this is going to just cancel out, right. And this, this, this is the gradient and we want this to be equal to 0, uh, which gives us x transpose x theta equals x transpose y. And this equation that we have here is called the normal equation. Okay. And from this, you can solve for theta to be equal to um, x transpose x inverse x transpose y, as long as x transpose x is invertible, right. And for now, let us assume x transpose x is invertible. If you have two rows, uh, two columns in your matrix that are duplicates of each other, then x transpose x may not be invertible. But we'll address you know those kind of um, um, oddities later. For now, assume x transpose x is invertible, and this gives you an estimator for theta hat. Right. So this is called the uh, normal equation, and. It is, it, is, it is only in the case of, um, so linear regression is one of the few cases where you can come up with an exact solution and not, and not 
limited to a numerical solution for which we need a computer. Right? This is an exact solution for calculating theta hat uh, or, or to minimize your cost function because j of this theta hat is going to minimize your is going to uh, minimize this to be the smallest. Right? Any questions? Yes, question. Right. So, what's the use of the other approach? The the other approach is uh, we we use linear regression to describe gradient descent because it is easy to derive the update rules for for the purposes of you know education. Right. You're going to use gradient descent based approaches for pretty much all other machine learning algorithms like uh, that we're going to come across in this course. Linear regression is one ex exception which you can solve it with gradient descent. There's no problem solving it with gradient descent. But you also have a closed form solution for linear regression which the other algorithms don't have. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Now, let's, let's kind of um, see a few more interpretations of this. There are um, so there is a probabilistic interpretation of this. Right? So in the probabilistic interpretation, we make this assumption that the way our yi's are generated in our training set is through this process. So yi is equal to theta transpose xi plus epsilon i, where epsilon i is some kind of a, a, a Gaussian noise with mean 0 variance sigma square. Right? So what does this mean? It means the way our data set is generated is we start with some x. For example, if you're talking about the, the uh, price of a house, the x's will describe the features of that house, like the area or, or number of bedrooms, etc. Right? And there exists some unknown theta vector that, you know, that we are interested in calculating. And the way the corresponding yi is generated is by taking the dot product of theta and uh, theta and the features of the uh, you know, of, of the input, and adding a random Gaussian noise. Right now, the noise that gets added to each example is a different noise, but the noises are distributed according to a Gaussian variable, uh, according to a Gaussian distribution. Right? Does this, this, this is the assumption that we are making. Right? This may or may not hold true in reality, but this we, we start with the way our, our uh, uh, we start with this assumption to describe the way our data is generated. Now, then what we what we um, what we then do is swap the terms around. So, epsilon i. Is is um, is a random Gaussian uh, variable, which means epsilon i is also equal to y i minus theta transpose x i, right? Just move epsilon over and, and um, um, uh, uh, theta transpose x to the other side, and this term is therefore. So, y minus theta transpose xi is also uh, distributed according to a Gaussian variable, which now means that
this is um, this is the claim that we make because epsilon i is normally distributed right y minus theta transpose xi is also normally distributed with with mean 0 and um, variance sigma square which means probability of y given x has this density function is this clear any questions of how we went from here to here yes yeah so in this case um, the parameters of this probability density of this probability density is theta right theta is the is the um, um, uh, uh, probability density that is given to us uh, or, or, or the parameter that is given to us. Unlike the usual Gaussians where the parameter is, is mu, this is a reparameterized version where the parameters are theta. So, what this means is Y i, so uh, that, that's a good question. Let me let me clarify this a little further. Right? So Gaussian variables have this this um, property where so if if y i minus theta transpose x i is is distributed according to um, Gaussian now y i minus theta transpose xi is distributed as normal right this also implies yi because gaussians have this have this um, what's also called as location scale property where you can you can move your gaussian if you, if you add some constant to your um, um, Gaussian random variable, then it just you know moves the uh, uh, Gaussian there. So over here, nothing in this is random; it's just some constant, right? So if y i minus theta transpose x i is distributed according to this, then it means y i is distributed according to uh, a normal distribution that has mean theta transpose x i and variance sigma square, right? And now this is the mean and this is the variance, and you know that's what you see here. Exactly. So we are we are we are um, we are assuming that y i has is is distributed as a normal random variable uh, as as a standard normal variable whose mean is different for different examples. So for for y two the mean is going to be theta transpose x two, right? For y one it's uh, the mean is theta transpose x one. And this statement is exactly the same as this statement, right? So to to jump from here to here. So uh, it's easy to kind of uh, uh, go through these steps. So if epsilon i is y minus theta transpose x i um, distributed according to, uh, according to Gaussian, that means um, you know y i minus theta transpose x i is, is distribution according to a mean zero Gaussian, which also means y i is distribution is distributed according to a normal with mean theta transpose x i and uh, variance sigma square, and this can be you know and, and therefore the probability density of y i is given by this right so y i is the is, is is the variable this is the mean this is the uh, variance yes question yes i missed the one half thank you thank you is is this clear right now once we have this, once we have uh, 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 yi in this form, we are now going to do maximum likelihood. This question? Exactly. So here, um, we are given the data x's and y's which is distributed according to some unknown parameter and now 
the data is given and the parameters are unknown. And we are going to do maximum likelihood to estimate the parameters. Right? So the data is the x's and y's. Parameters are generally it is mu and sigma square, but in this case, the parameters are theta and sigma square, but theta is not the, is not the mean, right? Theta transpose x is the mean for each y, right? So the, this is a, 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 a conditional distribution, right? And so we can write the likelihood function as i equals 1 to n probability of yi given xi with, with the given theta, right? And we are making an iid assumption, that is the case all the time. We assume that the epsilons, the epsilons over here are iid, which means we can break down the likelihood as a product of n different, different terms. How are we doing with respect to n? No, we have 10 more minutes. With respect to uh, n, and, and then what we do is in, instead of, of uh, the likelihood, we take the log likelihood, right? And this is going to give us log, um, log of that PDF. So uh, the sum i equals one, 1 to n, we can call this L theta. x of minus half yi minus theta transpose xi square over sigma square. Right? Let me write this a little more clearly. This is just L theta. All right. Now, let's take a step back and kind of analyze this. The function over which, the, the, the variable over which we have theta, and that comes up here. Right. And now, um, with this likelihood function, you can kind of, you know, um, zoom out and look at this expression, and you can see that log and x are something that cancel out, right? The the two pi sigma square is just some constant. We are assuming sigma square is some just some unknown constant. This is some constant again. We have a minus half square, so all this is going to, you know. The, 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 uh, I guess the summary here is that, you know, by looking at this expression, your attention should naturally just focus on this part, right? Everything else just, 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 you know, goes away, right? The, you can write this as sum over i equals 1 to n, log of some constant is some k, we don't care log and the exponent cancel out, minus half, some sigma square, okay. yi minus theta transpose xi square, there is a half, right? And so, is equal to, I'm going to take this k out, or some n times k, or um, some constant, minus 1 over sigma square half equals 1 to n right so the likelihood function the log likelihood function 
by making a probabilistic assumption about the noise is going to give us the negative of a scaled version of the original cost function, right? Which means by performing maximum likelihood, we are minimizing the squared error. Does that make sense? So this 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 is kind of um, whenever you see a Gaussian come into picture, you know this is probably the most important thing. It is the exponent of some squared entity, and when you take the log likelihood, you know the log and the exponent cancel out, and you're going to be left with just the the square term, right? And it's going to come with a negative sign, and because we are doing maximum likelihood, we're trying to maximize the negative of something, which means we're trying to minimize this. Yes, question? Exactly. What we've shown here is that um, is that linear regression can be viewed as performing maximum likelihood, where the noise that comes into each example is assumed to be a Gaussian noise. Right? If you make the assumption that the the x's and y's have a linear relationship and have an additive Gaussian noise, then the maximum likelihood theory tells you what you need to do is exactly the same as minimizing the you know, squared error or ordinary least, least squares. The, the, the two, are, uh, the two uh, approaches of you know, defining the cost function and minimizing it or giving it a probabilistic setting and maximizing the likelihood are exactly the same. Right? So, to you know, just me my arg max of L theta was equal to arg min of J theta. Right? There are some extra scaled versions, but we are not interested in the values, but we are interested in the arg max and the arg min, right? And they are exactly the same. This question. Yeah, so the question is, if we made an uh, uh, assumption that uh, epsilon instead of Gaussian was Poisson, what, what would happen? And for that, I would say, wait till where we're going to cover GLMs, right? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. And what we're going to see is, is um, the maximum likelihood uh, uh, interpretation is actually more general and you can, you can, um, um, you can do many more things. Yes, question. So the epsilon uh, over here is actually the difference between uh, kind of the true y value and the observed y value. Like uh, theta transpose xi is like in a way like the true price of the house, but what you observe has some noise in it. You know, maybe the mood of the buyer was was bad that day, and there's there, there's some noise that gets added into the process, and you're making an assumption that the noise is is, is Gaussian. Okay. Now, in the last few minutes that that we have, uh, I want to provide yet another interpretation of linear regression, right? So we saw um, linear regression can be solved through gradient descent or through the normal equations. We saw that linear regression is, is actually the same as maximum likelihood if you assume that the noise is Gaussian. Now, here's yet another uh, view of linear regression. Now, if, if uh, what we want to solve is x theta equals y, right? Now here x is a matrix, theta is a vector, and y is another vector, right? Now remember the, the, um, the functional view of matrices that we spoke about earlier? So you can imagine um, an input space theta 1, theta 2, theta d. You have a matrix X and you have an output space. Y1, Y2, Yn. Now, let me intentionally 
keep this two dimensional. So we have theta 1 to through theta d. Right. What this means is we have some theta, some some uh, parameter space theta. That's the input space to the matrix X. X is the design matrix. Right. Now the rows of your the data is actually in X, not in theta. Right. And Y is 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 the corresponding uh, uh, Y labels. Now what we want is to find theta that that makes our output as close to y as possible right we also saw in when we were lin, uh, reviewing linear algebra that if x is not full rank then there exists a subspace in x a lower dimensional subspace that has a, a one to one mapping between the input and the output space right now for now let's assume x is full rank which means if x is in is in d by n and d is the smaller dimension then assume that x has rank d right and y is in an n dimensional space right? so n is generally much larger right n is much larger and the given data so the training say, set that we are given is represented by this matrix x and some point in this output space of y's where this point Remember, y's are all scalars. So each dimension is representing a different example. Right? It's an n-dimensional space where each dimension represents a different example. And there's going to be some subspace in, in the output space. Right? You know, it passes through the origin, which for which there is a bijection between theta and the subspace. And also, the set of all points in the output space that can be reached by theta is limited to that subspace. Right? We remember that. Now, we also spoke about projections. Right? Now, if you have a matrix X whose columns define a set of bases onto which we want to project something, Right, the projection matrix was. Anybody remembers? X transpose, X transpose, what? X inverse, X transpose. This was the projection matrix. So this subspace defines the set of all points that can be reached through linear combinations of X, right? And those columns are, you know, basically the columns over here, right? And the projection matrix of this output subspace is this right now which means the given y supposing we are given some value y most likely it's not going to reside in the subspace it's because you know the the the, the space the n dimensional space is so much larger and the d dimensional space d is so much smaller than n that very likely the y that we observe is not going to lie in the space exactly in the subspace exactly right and what we want to do is now project this point onto the subspace such that it's perpendicular right so this is our observed vector of y's that we want to project onto the subspace that that is reachable through x right and the the, the projection matrix is going to be this and what the the, the point onto which it gets projected will have a one to one mapping with some point over here right so which means x theta hat is going to be equal to x x transpose x inverse x transpose y right this is the projection matrix this is the vector that we want to project, right? And this basically kind of is another way of seeing that you know, theta hat equals x transpose x inverse equals x transpose y. Right? Does it make sense? 
So, this is the projection matrix that will take any vector in the output space and project it onto the column space of, of x and we take the vector y and project it onto the column space of x and once it is in the column space of x, there will exist some Made some uh, some some vector in the input space that you know because there's a bijection between the, the 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 column space and the row space, which means x theta hat equals some some value will have an inverse because there's a one to one bijection that exists, and that inverse is is you know because because now you know x is now kind of invertible because it's in that space where the bijection exists theta hat is is equal to x transpose x equals x, uh, x transpose x uh, inverse x transpose y. Right? So basically what linear ex, uh, regression is doing is projecting the y values onto the subspace reachable through x and then solving, um, uh, uh, finding theta hat you know, corresponding to that projection. Yes, question? I'm sorry? So how, how do we know it's the optimal theta? Uh, here optimal in the sense, um, so, so we, uh, we, we, when, we, when we spoke about uh, projections, we discussed this interpretation that the point to, to which you get projected is in a way the closest possible point to the true vector, right? So in that way, you're trying to find a theta that will, that will take you to a point that is closest to y. Right? And basically, Pythagoras theorem tells you that the square of distance terms is equal to the sum of the squares of, you know, the each components, and that, you know, uh, turns out to be exactly equal to. So Pythagoras theorem tells you that this is equal to the square of this residual. Right? All right. With that, we will we will conclude uh, our um, um, our survey of uh, linear regression, and next. We're going to start with classification.